Living Source Church. How's everybody doing this morning? Are you guys awake? Are you alive? Okay, all right. I'm just making sure because I came to bring a word from the Lord this morning. I came to bring something to you this morning that God wants us to speak in this house, in this place. Um, and I'm excited. I thank God that I'm able to be uh, one of the pastors here. If you don't know who I am, my name is Eric. I'm one of the pastors here at the Source Church. Uh, Pastor Chris and Viv are in Puerto Rico having a great time, all right? And we want to bless our pastor and thank him for always being, a, you know, being here week after week preaching, but sometimes he needs a little break, amen? He needs to be with his wife in Puerto Rico, right? All right. Um, so we love, uh, Pastor Chris, if you're watching, we love you. We thank God for you. Um, but I get an opportunity to preach and be a part of this series called Better Together. Everybody say it together. Let's say Better Together. That's right. We are better together. And this is about how community is an answer to many different parts of our lives. And uh, it's premised on this verse that I'm going to read to you. So, But for you, if you want to follow along with us, we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 10. So if you want to Open that up in your mobile device or you want to, if you have your physical Bible like I do, you know, uh, it's going to be in the back there. Uh, so we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 10. And so that's where we're going to take off. But I'm reading out of Ecclesiastes right now to just kind of get us all started. All right. And it says this. Well, first, let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you for your word. It is alive. It is active. God, you have something to say to us now in this hour, in this place. I pray that, God, that everyone who's here today, everyone who could hear, whether online or physically here in this room, Lord, I pray that our lives are touched, transformed, changed by your word. Your word has the power to transform our minds. Help us grow. Help us move on. Help us find and discover wisdom God, your word gives us life that we cannot just live by bread alone. We must live by the very words that come from your mouth. And then we thank you, Jesus, that you have given us your word. And so this morning I pray, I pray, God, that we would hear it, we would believe it, and we would obey. In Jesus' name, and everybody say with a mighty voice, amen. Amen. Okay, so Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 says, Two are better than one. I want you to grasp that for a second. Two are better than one. And why? Because they have a good return for their labor. There's a good return out of two people versus somebody being by themselves. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But now look what it says. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. That's a tragedy. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. So when we read this verse, and this is kind of the premise of our whole series about the need for community, one of the things that's Highlighted in this verse that we're going to talk about today is despair. Everybody say despair. Now, it's important that we understand what despair is, and so I'm going to define it in just a second. But you see that, you'll see despair if you're alone. You see, it says, um, if two people fall down, well, one can help out the other. But if, you, if you're a, by yourself and you fall down, they're like, oh, man, we pity you. Because you may have hurt yourself and you're not able to get back up again. Or let's say that you near, you were in the cold. Well, two people can warm each other up. You can survive. But man, if you're by yourself, if you've got nobody with you, oh man, you're, you're going to die. You're going to die freezing to death. It goes on to say, well, what if you're attacked and you're by yourself? Who's going to help you if you're overpowered, Right? That's, that's, that's a tragedy. That's a, those are times of despair, and a lot of us can experience and have experienced in this room and people who are watching online and people all around the world experience seasons and times of despair when things happen to you. See, the same things that were happening to the person alone were also happening to the two people, except 
One did not have community, the other did. Amen? And this is what we're talking about this morning, that community, and this is the premise of today's sermon, is an answer to times of despair. And and I'm going to describe what despair is. Despair, according to the dictionary, is the complete loss or absence of hope. Some of you may have experienced moments like this. If we can get really honest in here, I don't want you to prove that you're some person who your life is going so well. Even everyone around the world goes through times of despair when something is lost, when you lose someone, when something was taken from you, when you lost a job or someone made fun of you or you got embarrassed or you, you fell into sin or you got caught in sin or something like that, or something that happens to you. Maybe something, it's physical, something happened to you, or you got sick. Something that caused despair in your life. Now, either some of you in here, you are, you are, out of, you are just coming out of that season, you just experienced it, or you did just a while back, or you're going through it right now. Or, and I don't think there's a lot of people like this, but you're heading for it. Now, I'm not, I don't want, I don't, now listen, listen, I'm not, I don't want you to go through despair. I'm not asking for something bad to happen to you. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that in life, you are going to go through seasons of despair. Jesus does not promise that you will not go through these seasons. The question is, do you have community with you? Are you alone or you got someone by your side? That's the question. And what, the, and what we're saying here is that community is an answer to your times of despair. You will need that to get through or you will fall down and not be able to get back up or you will be overpowered because someone's attacking you or you'll freeze to death because there's no one to keep you warm. There's no one to comfort you. There's no one to help you. And this is why God's word makes it so crucial that you need community. You need people in your life. And now we're not just talking about just friends and family. We're saying we're gonna go to the level of you need people who are on the same spiritual fortitude with you about where you are with Christ and God. You're gonna need that in your times of despair. And so despair can also be the feeling. Everybody say the feeling. Come on, say it with me. Come on, come on. The feeling. You, Cause you know, you know what it's like to feel things. A lot of us are led by our feelings, but it's, I like the way that the dictionary made sure to, the Cambridge made sure to put that. The feeling that there is no hope and that you can do nothing to improve a difficult or worrying situation. That's what despair is. I think that everybody in this room has either been through something like that that's made you feel that way, think that way. Some of us are even living that way. You're living in despair. We may have no people who have done things in their lives because they could not get over the feeling of despair. They could not, their mind could not change in the way that they were thinking. Everything that they thought and said and did was through the feelings of despair and tragedy happening to their life. In fact, people define themselves by something that happened to them because they went through despair. And so despair essentially means and equals that someone has no hope or despair can just be that you are hopeless this is how you see life this is how you feel this is how you are even for some people living like this and that that is not of God everybody say that's not God that is not God God is not wanting you to be hopeless now will we go through times of despair absolutely Does that have to mean that you have no hope? No. Because you can feel despair, but that doesn't mean that you have to live in despair. And that's what I want to talk about. So what's the answer to despair? What's the the combative uh, spiritual weapon that we have to times of despair? It is a community of hope. A house of hope. And so I have you in 1 Corinthians or or Hebrews chapter 10, and we're going to go there in just a second. But I want you to think about this. One of my favorite movies that kind of cap, that gets into this, if you, 
if you're if you're an adult, you should watch it, okay? But it's it's a movie that's well known. It's called The Shawshank Redemption. It's actually my favorite movie. Like I'm a film teacher, and so when kids ask me, Mr. Plumer, what's your favorite movie? I'm like The Shawshank Redemption. All the kids know that. It's a poster in my room, and uh, the reason why it is my favorite movie, it's actually my comfort movie. Like if I had to turn on a movie right now and like watch it, it would be The Shawshank Redemption. And the reason why is because it has this life message that I love, but it's about hope. And in the movie, it is going through this entire narrative and story about what is hope. What is hope? Because in the movie, one of the key persons is, some of you know Morgan Freeman's character, who is Ellis Redding. And he's been in prison because he, he did something terrible. And he's, he actually is in prison because he did something wrong. And so he says this to Andy, who's the person who's there in his innocence, right? He's in prison innocently, Andy Dufresne. And he tells this to Andy. He says, hope is a dangerous thing. Hope can drive a man insane. And why does he feel that way? Because throughout the movie, he doesn't think that he can ever get out of Shawshank. He will die in Shawshank. He is trapped by the prison of Shawshank. In reality, he can't get over what he did so long ago. The mistake that he made, the, the murderous act that he committed, he can't get over it. And so he's stuck there with no hope. And Andy tries to show Red that there is hope. There is life after Shawshank, right? You can get out. And so what happens with Andy at the end of the movie when Red is looking for Andy, he's like going out to search for him because Andy broke out of prison. Uh, sorry, spoiler alert, right? Uh, but it's awesome. You still watch it. It's amazing, all right? Um, he gets out. He goes to Cehuataneo, which is in Mexico. And so, um, you know, Red is like, well, I'm going to go to Mexico, right? And he looks for his friend, and he's given a letter that Andy wrote for him. And in it, this is what Andy says at the end of the movie. He says this about hope because it's about defining what hope is. He says, and listen to this, listen to this very carefully because it's very biblical. Hope is a good thing, maybe even the best of things. And good things never die. Listen, that literally is a Bible verse. It is 1 Corinthians 13, 13. It says, three things will last forever, faith, Hope and love. Now, the greatest of these things is what? Love. We know that. But, but there are three things, though, that will last forever. So there are, there, are, there are some things that you can experience in this life that will go with you into eternity. Your money won't. Your wealth, your influence, who you think you are, all that, all that is not going to make it. But what will make it into, into the kingdom is your faith, your hope, and your love. Those three things are going to go with you. And so hope is in the Greek it is the word elpis. And elpis means, so because we're talking about hope, this is what we need. Hope is an expectation of what is surely certain. In other words, hope is the manifestation of our belief that God is in control and will use all things for his purposes. Now, that's a far exceeding idea, but I want you to understand that this is how you have and produce an, a, a, an outlook on life in where you are able to see that although you are experiencing something now, that does not have to be the final straw. That this doesn't have to be forever. That, that there is one thing that is forever, and that's hoping in the fact that God is really the true one that's in control, not the person who did this to me, not the mistake that I made, not the devil, right? God is in control. In fact, this is from Romans chapter two, verse 28, and Romans eight is literally a whole chapter about hope, the hope of the Christian. Paul's writing at the end of his, explaining everything about the gospel, and in Romans eight, he's kind of summaring it up, and it's all about hope if you read it, but one of the things he explains in Romans eight twenty-eight which is a verse you probably heard of, but it's one that you should know, you should grab, you should hold on to it for the rest of your life. If there was anything that you get today, hold on to Romans 8, 28, and it's this. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. This gives you hope. That even if Terrible things happen to you. God works all things, even if you go through times of despair. God works all things 
for the good of those who love him in accordance to his purpose. Not other people's, not the world's, not the devil's, not even yourself. For God's own purpose. Amen? Now, the question is going to be is, well, what does community have to play in that? Can I get hope without community? But I want you to read through Hebrews chapter 10 with me as we're there. And so we're going to start in verse 19, okay? So Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, this is what we're reading. He says, therefore, brothers and sisters. Now, when the Bible says therefore, that means that everything before chapter 10, he's wrapping up, okay? He's kind of concluding everything that he said. Now, in the book of Hebrews, he is speaking to a community of Christians that are Jewish but believe that Jesus is the Messiah, okay? So the gospel first went to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. Gentiles are considered like, and I'm guessing that most of you in here are probably on the, on the side of Gentiles, okay? That, that means you're not Jewish. So if you're not Jewish, you're automatically a Gentile, okay? Like I'm a Gentile. And so the Jews here in the book of Hebrews are Jewish people who believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They believe that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Now, if you read the book of Hebrews, you will quickly pick up that he is using a lot of Old Testament passages and imageries and prophecies and typology of showing this community Jesus is the Messiah to come, okay? So he's concluding now, therefore, brothers and sisters, to this community of people who believe that Jesus is the Messiah. But listen when he says, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of goats and lambs, no, by the blood of who? Jesus, that Jesus was the offering and sacrifice for all of us. He says, by a new and living way opened for us. You're gonna see that the writer in, makes an emphasis on not only them, he doesn't say he did this for you, but he says us, like he is including himself and all of the community that he's talking to. By a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. That means we all have access to God because of what Christ did for us in, in dying and being raised to life. So he says, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God. And I want you to pay attention to that verse there. It says, over the house of God. So Jesus didn't just become your savior. If you believe that Jesus is your savior, you also must by virtue believe that Jesus is your great high priest. Like he's, he's your mediator between you and God. He's the way that you access God. But it's not like you just access God by yourself. No, he's saying, no, Jesus is a great high priest and a mediator over the house of God. Now, previously in the book of Hebrews, he explains who the house of God are. So back in Hebrews 3, I'm going to read it to you. He says, but Christ, as the son, is in charge of God's entire house. And we, we are God's house if we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope. Everybody say hope. You keep your hope in Christ. So how do you, how are you part of the house? You got your hope in Jesus. That's how you know that you're in the house. Not, not because of who you think you are or what you call yourself. No, no, that your hope is in Jesus. And if your hope is in Christ, Christ is over that house. That means that this house is full of hope. It's, it's full of people who are hopeful in Christ, despite what they go through. And I'm going to show you that this, these people, even though he's calling them, he's saying, yeah, you are, you are God's house, right? He's going to show them that even if you're over God's house, they still went through some stuff that, is, that causes despair, that's considered tragic. But they didn't let that define them of who they were. I like what uh, Charles Spurgeon once said, because sometimes people have this idea of Christianity where it's just you and Jesus. It's just you and Jesus, you and Jesus. But, you know, it's like the church, meh. I mean, it's optional. 
right? It's optional to be part of the church, right? And, and don't get it twisted. I'm not saying that there isn't a reality that the church institution have done things that have hurt and affected people's lives. So I'm not contingent or making the case that your salvation is based on being a part of the church. I would never do that. But the idea that you don't have to be part of the church or you don't need community, but you're going to follow Jesus, I'm going to tell you, I've never read that from anywhere in Christ teaching that, that he ever came to someone who's like, yeah, it's just me and you, dude, just me and you and everybody else. Like, can you imagine if you were a disciple of Jesus and you were like, hey, Jesus, hey, I just want to follow you by myself, but like, you know, I don't, I don't really want to be with a 12, though. So like me and you, can we do our own thing? How do you think Jesus is going to look at you? No, you can join me in the 12, right? You're invited in the 12, but you're, but you're not going to have your own thing with me, right? Jesus always insisted on the idea of community. Jesus is building the community. That's his idea. So Jesus is not going to say, oh, you, you're so special. I'll just have something special for you out, out over here. Nah, Jesus is going to want you to be part of the community, he always did that. When he sent them two by two to go and minister the gospel, notice he sent them with someone else, two by two. Jesus always did things and disciple people with community. And that's the beautiful opportunity you have when you're doing power groups. It's not about you, you having your own Bible study with Jesus by yourself every morning. No, it's about you spending time with God's people and learning together. That's, that's why we do power groups, Amen. Because we want you to experience the fullness of God and learning about Christ. When you're in a power group, that's, you're really learning like a disciple of Jesus in that context. More, I would insistently say, than if you were just reading the Bible by yourself. Because when you're with people, that's exactly what Jesus would have done. Jesus would have had you and someone else and a group of people, when they were the 12, they were reading scripture together. So you didn't have the disciples were like, okay, everybody, take your Bible and you guys go out in the forest and you... No, they did it together. Everybody say together. Together. You, it, we're better together. We're better together. Uh, Charles Spurgeon says, some Christians try to go to heaven alone in solitude. But believers are not compared to bears or lions or other animals that wander alone. Those who belong to Christ are sheep in this respect, that they love to get together. And sheep, if you've ever seen sheep, they do. They just gravitate towards each other. And sheep go in flocks. And so do God's people. The absence of hope in our lives comes from the absence of truly knowing God and not having community in our lives. If, if we feel there's a lack of hope in you, that, you, that things can't change, I would, I would simply ask you, a couple things. When someone comes to me and they're like, they feel like they're distanced with, they're distanced with God, right? Like some people in here would do that or I have people call me and they're like, man, Eric, I feel like God's far from me, this and that, blah, 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 blah. And you know what? I, I just like three things that I always go to. Number one, hey, when was the last time that you read God's word? And they're gonna say, probably to me, if they're honest, ah, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's been a while. Pastor Eric, I haven't really read God's word. And I'll be like, okay, well, how, how are you expecting God to connect with you? Like, how are you gonna hear from God, right? You thought he was just gonna speak to you in the middle of nowhere, right? Like, like you deserved an audible voice for God to come to you? Now, he might do that. I'm not gonna, I'm, we would never put limits on our God. But I'm pretty sure if you just read what he already audibly said, I think that you can hear from God a lot quicker, Right? You, can, you can open up the word and find some real good encouragement and hearing from the Lord if you just, if you just read your Bible. Right? So they'll, they'll, I'll be like, hey, man, you, you got to get back in the word, bro. If you get back in the word, and I'll ask them, like, remember when you were in the word? They were like, yeah, I really was connected with God. I'm like, so, so if you disconnect from the word, you're going to feel disconnected, right? Number two, when was the last time that you prayed? Like, sincerely, you like, God, not quick prayers. I'm not like, you got alone, and you were like, seeking God. Oh, man, no. That's been a while, too. Okay, how was God supposed to hear you if you don't say nothing? If you don't give him your attention? You want God to, you want God to hear you, and you want God's attention, but you don't spend the time to just 
be before him physically. Like, God, I'm giving you my mind. Please talk to me. So that'll be number two for me. And sometimes they pray or they, or they don't read the word. Or sometimes they read the word, but they don't pray. But here's a third one that I absolutely have learned over time that is so crucial. The last thing I will ask them is, hey, do you go to church and are you connected to a small group or are you, are you connected to your community that people know who you are and what you're going through? And if a lot of times people will be like, oh, no, I, I really haven't been going to church, right? Or I, I'm not really part of a small group. And I'll say, dude, this would be so much easier for you when you are connected with people who are also connecting with God and if they saw that you were not connecting with God, they could keep you accountable. They could encourage you. They could speak for God to you. It's almost like you cut yourself off from all the different ways that God could speak to you and he wants to speak to you, but you won't let him in. Your ears are not open, your eyes are not open, and your hands are not open. So having community Having a physical place where people can see you discerned by the Spirit of God and be able to say, hey, are you all right, man? Is, is there something you need? People could pray for you where you could confess your sin if something's going on. If you did something bad, you have a place where you can trust. And that's so important to the Christian life. Because if we keep these things to ourselves and we live alone, the Bible says that, man, Tragedy and despair will overcome you, will overtake you in your time. So community is absolutely crucial to giving us hope in our time of despair. Look what it says. Um, God gives you a community so that your hope won't run out. God gives you a community so that times of despair don't overcome you. Now, if you go a little further, if you go back to another place, Paul talks about his time of despair that he went through. Now, I think it's very different what he's going through than what we're going through. But I want you to read what he says, because even though he goes through despair, which you and I might experience at some level, look at what he says, though. Like, look what he, how he thinks about his despair and then think about what he keeps during his despair, because he didn't go through it alone. He had other people who went through the same thing. But look what he says. In 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 11, read with me. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the afflictions we experienced in Asia. So he wants this community to know that. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. That's a very suicidal thought. I don't know if you understand what he just said there. That's a, that's a thought of him saying like he just hated existing in life. He did not like the way that things were going. Paul was at an end, but even think about the fact that he was not alone and that he had God. He had community in God, and even in this moment, he didn't give up. Look what he says. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. We deliver, he delivered us from such a deadly peril that he, will deli- that he will deliver us. On him, we have set our what? Our hope. We have set our hope that he will deliver us, us again. So he was not going through this by himself. You also must help us by prayer so that the many will give thanks on behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. And so he's now reaching out. He has community that's going through this with him. And now he's reaching out to, these, to the Corinthians who he knows, who he loves. And he's saying, hey, I need you to pray for me because we're going through it right now. We're going through this horrendous thing. And I want to know that you are praying for me. But you can never do that if you're not connected to a community of faith. Who are you going to reach out to when something happens? Where, where is your hope going to come from? Uh, Last, um, hope does not just replace despair. Hope overcomes it. And so in verse 22, now Paul in Hebrews chapter 10, he talks about let us. He's going to say this three times. Let us do this together. And this is my three points. Before we leave, these are the three points. He says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance 
that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. And so here's today's point with reading that verse. Together, together, we can approach God with our burdens, problems, sins, anxiety, cares, requests, and prayers together. You will feel much more confident in your prayer life if you had someone who was praying with you. I remember when I was, just a quick story, I remember when I was like, I really need to find a wife. I really need to find a wife. Okay, I was young, 25, and I was like, I can't, I can't live like this no more. <laughs> I was like, I need a wife, Lord Jesus. And my friend Peter at the time said, hey, brother, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray with you for the next couple months. We're going to pray together every day for your wife. And that gave me some serious confidence. That gave me so much confidence. I was like, oh, okay. I wasn't alone to ask for this. My brother was like, no, I, want, I, feel, I feel your pain. I want that for you too. I, and, and guess what happened a couple months later? I met my wife. She's beautiful. I had no idea what she looked like, who she was going to be, right? She was, she's a 10. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a little two, right? Right, on the scale, like, right? <laughs> so, so I didn't, she was definitely way out of my league for sure. But because someone prayed with me, because I had community, God answered my prayer, man, that my prayer life was so much stronger. This is a difference when you have someone who can pray with you for things. It's just so different. Verse 23, let us, he says, let us, everybody say, let us, us, hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And so what is he saying now? He's saying, together, we can hold the hope in Christ by our confession, commitments, accountability, and mutual faith. You will, listen, your hope will be so much stronger when you have a community of faith of people who also have hope. Because when you're, you feel hopeless, you have people who are hopeful for you. They have something to give you. But if you're hopeless by yourself... Where's the hope going to come from? It's not magic. It's got to come from somewhere. How, how is someone going to tell you that, hey, dude, hey, listen, this is not forever. How is someone going to tell you, no, 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 I know you did something wrong, but there's forgiveness. How, how are you going to know that unless someone is with you? The way that God often speaks to us is through other people. He'll speak through his word. He'll speak through prayer and, and peace surpassing understanding. But a lot of time, God will send someone to you, and he will be a brother in Christ, a sister in Christ, who also has the Holy Spirit. And that person can literally be like the tangible presence of God in your life. Because they carry the same spirit that you have. And in your time of need, they have been given what you need. They can say, brother, I've been, I've been there. I understand where you're coming from. And they can even relate to you. So when you're sitting there and you're going through something, you're like, I don't know, nobody understands what I'm going through. No, that's not true. That's the devil. The devil wants to make you think that you're the only one, that you're alone, and, you're, and God's going to put you as the only person to feel like you're going to go through that. That's hogwash. That's, that's not from God. No, no. There's other people who have gone through that, and they are there to help you through it. That's our God. God's never lived, left you alone. When God says, I will never leave you or forsake you, that means that he has a community of people for you to be with so that when you go through your times of despair, you are not alone. Because God does not want you to fall and not be able to get back up. God does not want you to freeze in your sleep. God does not want you to be attacked and be by yourself. Last one. He says... Let us consider how we may spur on one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. 
Now, a couple verses later, he's going to talk to this church and he's going to say, listen, I remember what you've gone through. This church, these people, this community of faith went through some very tragic things. If you go down a couple verses, he says this. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light? He's talking about when you received the gospel, when you believed in Jesus. He says, when you endured great conflict, conflict full of suffering, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you stood by the side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation, confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had a better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. And so he's telling this church, keep your hope. I know someone stole your house and took your house from you, but keep your hope. I know that you guys have suffered public humility where your reputation and now even your job is at stake. Keep your hope alive. I know that you've gone through that. Now, go back to the verse that he said before. We were re just reading where he says, let us consider how we may spur one another towards love and good deeds. These people needed to gather together and remind each other how we can do good for this community, how we can spread the gospel. And he says, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Do you realize that these people had these people who were going through this kind of suffering, some of them had created a habit of not going to church because they were literally going through despair for going to church. Like for you, like imagine if you, in order for you to come here today, you had to do so with the risk of knowing that you would suffer somehow, either with someone taking your stuff or people knowing they're making fun of you or your reputation online. Now we would all say in here, we would be like, like as American Christians in the 21st century, me and you read that and we go, well, I mean, I can understand that. And I can read that and go, oh man, that's, I understand. But then I think about, but then like, what's our excuse? Oh, we didn't go to church because I didn't feel like it this morning? It, it dawned on me like, these people, I think in an American Christian perspective, we would say, well, I can understand why you don't want to do that. But, but the, the, the writer of the book of Hebrews is like, no, man, that, even that's not an excuse. Because you still need to come here so we can encourage you. So that even though we know you were going through suffering for being a Christian, we can encourage you. You still need to meet. But what's, what's our excuse? Why don't we come to church? Why aren't we ta taking community seriously like we need it? Oh, because you think you can do it on your own? Because you can watch it on YouTube? Because you can get a good message somewhere else? You don't think you really need to be people? Or you don't like people? Right? Or, and, and don't get it twisted. Please hear me. I'm not, I'm not saying like, you're like, okay, Brother Eric, like, I can't go on vacation. No, of course you can go on vacation. Right? Pastor Chris is on vacation. We, Pastor Chris, go on vacation. Right? Go be with your wife. No problem. Oh, Eric, we got an engagement on, on Sunday. Yeah, no problem. I'm not hunting you down on Sunday morning. We're not calling, hey, where are you this morning, right? Not happening. I'm talking about what is your habit in you? What is your church habit that you know right now you do? Is your, is your church habit like, hey, I know in my mind, like I need, I need my community of faith weekly? Or is it like, eh, it's bi-weekly? Or are you like, it's actually monthly. I only really need church monthly. Or maybe it's bi-monthly. You're here like every other other month, right? Comes once in a while. There are people who literally only come to church once a year. God forbid there are people who have been, not been in church for a decade. <laughs> Ten years. No, the book of Hebrews is trying to tell you, listen, we don't have American Christians. We don't have an excuse to not gather and find our need for encouragement. No, we are to gather together. We need people in our lives. 
And when there's that, and I get it, there are times where even, I know some of you are shocked, Pastor Eric does not want to go to church. There are times I wake up and I'm like, I don't know if I really wanna go. I, I mean, I could just skip this week. I could, but God reminds me in my heart, like, no, dude. No, you need community. You need to be encouraged. I have something to say to you through someone else, or I have to say something through you to someone else. I have hope to either need to receive or I have hope that I need to give. But I am a part of this house of hope. So whether I need it or I have to give it, the only way I can is if I'm here. Amen? And, and that's why you need hope. You need community in your times of despair. You need our community. We just had a family in our church go through a time of despair. And I promise you, one of the game-changing things that they will say in their experience of their child having something tragic happen to them is the fact that they have been overwhelmed, I can tell, by the community of faith showing up. Our own worship leader, I wanna put Josh out there. Josh drove all the way to Orlando to see this family and to sing songs with them and let them know they're loved and let them know they have hope. Let them know that don't let this moment happen. And I, and, and I know that I'm not putting Josh on the spot. I'm only saying because our community, this is who we are, Source Church. We are a community of faith. We're a community of hope. We're a community of love. These things never run out. These are the things that drive us so that when time, when people go through despair, we show up. We have hope to give. We're hope dealers. We traffic hope. That's what we do. That's what Christians do. We don't traffic evil. We don't dope evil. We give good things, things that never die. That's what we do. Come on, Source Church. So, but I don't want to end on that moment. I want to end on a much more powerful note right now, and this is this. If you've experienced either before, like I'm saying like at some point in time in the past, or even right now, you are going through despair. Like something has happened to you, you have felt that. I want you to stand up. Like you have been, and it doesn't matter. This is not like you had to go through something crazy. I'm saying that you just, you felt a moment of where you felt despair. You felt that, hey, I, I, I have felt through, I've gone through something that I felt like was hopeless, okay? That things would not change. I was through a moment like that. And if we're really honest, everybody standing up. Because there's no way that you went through, God has not put you through something that where you could honestly say, man, oh man, I've gone through something. I want everyone to look around the room real quickly. Just take the time. It's not, look at me, look around the room. Look about how, how many people have gone through something that would be considered hopeless, okay? Because we can all recognize that. And yet, God wants to give you hope this morning. And so what I want us to do very briefly and literally for like one minute, okay? I want you to go to the person that's next to you. You may not know them. This may be even weird and a little uncomfortable at some level, okay? But this is just to break some barrier here and to genuinely for you to know there's community that you can just look at Pastor Eric the whole time. I want you to look at the people behind you, in front of you, and I want you to encourage one another with the Bible verse that's gonna be on from 2 Corinthians 4.18. I want you to encourage each other based on this verse and pray for one another. And then we are going to sing and pray out. Okay, so go right now. I want you to just turn to the person next to you. You don't have to get in big, huge groups, just one or two people. Just encourage the person that's next to you and pray for one another.
just encourage one another, pray for one another. We all need hope this morning. Even you who are watching online, I pray that you are praying for us. We have someone who's with you watching to pray with you. You can put that Bible verse back up for a second. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Let's sing this song to the Lord together. Let the spirit of hope rest on you. May you be filled with hope in your heart. May the God of hope be with you. Become aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness.